ball that is. Loftus cheek here. They can make it three. Hudson Adoy has made it three. He's done it again. Scored three home games in a row in the Europa League. What a moment for the teenager. Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Anacon Chelsea Season 2. I'm so pleased to be back, and I'm very pleased to have Nini on board with me from Blue Lions TV. The people have been asking for the collaboration <laughs> between Yannick <laughs> and Nini. Here it is, man. How you doing, brother? You good? Yeah, man, I'm doing really well. I'm just a bit stressed out, all the work, all the videos. You know, mm. it's one of them ones, really. But, uh, but yeah, I'm feeling good, and I'm, I'm really happy to be you know on with you on your podcast we've mm. been trying to do this for a while now and obviously thank you to everyone that's always you know that's showing me mad love and mm. like, it always takes me back by surprise but um no, hey. i really appreciate it it's hard work Nini. everyone sees your hustle uh i'm not gonna blow too much smoke up your ass for the whole podcast cause, <laughs> but but, but I enjoy it, though. yeah yeah <laughs> that's an exclusive ladies and gents <laughs> but, <laughs> but um yeah you're you're you know you represent the um the club very very well you've got the analytical mind i'm sure all the listeners agree out there and we again mate you know you've you've been a, a big part of my inspiration to tr- uh, start my own youtube channel and i've got uh, you know I'm, I'm very pleased that you you respect my angle on the on youtube and and that you know we can have a nice exchange we've talked on the phone a couple of times and i think this is going to be a superb podcast episode mate yeah, no pressure on me, but uh, but yeah, I, I'm yeah. feeling the same energy too. I think this is going to go well. Dude, it's super chill and the listener knows that. Right, mate, so we can talk about your channel at the very end. Usual format from last season, so we'll do it in two parts. Um, beginning with, I don't want to reflect really on the past season because you're a good friend of yours, Joe Tweedy, I had on and we did a sort of, we did a very big post-mortem of the yeah. Sari season. Uh, Joe has sort of mixed feelings of the whole experience, but you know, um, it, it ultimately was a success. So we'll sort of put a pin in the Sari narrative, I think, and we'll just yeah. talk about how, let's be honest, man, it's fucking hype for Frank Lampard. Um, but I want to get all your thoughts on it, but I'm just going to sort of express myself a little bit to pre- to preface all of it. I I always maintained the same stance on Lampard, how he's my favourite ev- ever Chelsea player. Um, it's a dream that this sort of charismatic, good-looking Chelsea legend, top scorer, very, you know, apparently got a higher yeah. IQ than Carol Vorderman. That's a weird little <laughs> bit of trivia there. Yeah. You know, suave in a suit, proper Chelsea, comes back and manages Chelsea. But for me, it was terrifying of the prospect of him coming back too prematurely and just not having the best chance to succeed, right? That's that's what I was freaked out about, because I wanted him to come in when the club was really, really settled, he had some experience under his belt, and I was terrified of ruining the Frank Lampard chance, right? I've, I've echoed this sentiment in the pod last season, how I feel like it would be too... You know, you've got one shot at Frank Lampard, and I didn't want us to fuck it up, right? Yeah. So, what now, now it's even before it was announced, I'm all aboard the hype train. <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely buzzing. And the fact how, you know, the Jody Morris is a huge part of it. Petr Cech in the technical advisor or essentially a director. Edwards yeah. getting promoted. There's talk about Makaleli and Drogba. You know, you can't not be on the hype train. So take some time, Nini. How do you feel about it, Lampard? Do you think it's a good time, bad time? And how do you feel about the whole backroom staff situation um i feel extremely happy and um i can actually talk about a little story I- i've been an advocate for this club promoting a coach from within to manage the club mm. or someone that has the experience to obviously that you know the experience where they understand how the club works the expectations of the club mm. and obviously how to fulfill them and um i remember a few years ago when when uh, CFC Fan TV used to be Chelsea Fan Channel back yes. in the day. Yeah. And uh, I remember that uh, I did a fan cam and I spoke about how, you know, it was when Mourinho left, you know, what can we do for the future? I was like, you know, why don't we turn to one of the coaches from within mm. and promote them similar to how, you know, Real Madrid mm. and Barcelona have done it with Zidane and Pep. And of course, typical of Chelsea Fan Channel, they were very like... Uh, <laughs> 
like very PR safe or whatever. Sure, sure. They they always select what goes online and what doesn't. Mm. So uh, you know they were like that from the start. Right. But um, but yeah, I, I brought that up to just say you know I've been an advocate for this direction from the club for many years now, mm. and I want to let you guys know that it, it feels like ridiculously surreal mm. that this is now becoming a reality. We've spoken so many times about you know opportunities for young players the inefficiency within the club, why we don't have the uh, infrastructure in place to start promoting, you know, these amazing top quality, top class academy graduates. But mm. um, that's finally happening now. The man we've always needed. And I, I don't see any negatives. I really don't see any negatives whatsoever. This whole thing about experience too is, is, is nothing <laughs> in my yeah. personal opinion as well. Yeah. I mean, what does that really mean? Uh, it's just like un- un- until you win something, no one rates you. I mean, mm. that's how it works. So yeah. uh, Sorry, can Lampard's tell you that. at a club right now where he's got top players, a lot of players that suit his style of football, mm. players that have a very high ceiling as well, and they can become anything they want mm. with hard work, determination, and you know, quality football as well. So I think for fans right now, we're really in a win-win situation. Mm. It's kind of like also with... Frank's not a, a dumbass, and he's he's. Pre- if you look at like some factors of how he's going to approach it, and we'll, we'll, you know we've got a whole podcast to get into this, but he does seem like he wants to play the right way. He's young enough to know how football's going and the state of yeah. it's in. He's pragmatic enough to not be stubborn. He's humble enough to not have the managerial ego. He's you know. He speaks so fucking well, man. I watched his Derby Very presses. Well. Yeah. yeah, he's so impressive. The Chelsea, the first Chelsea presser, is incredibly yeah. impressive. And you know what it was for me too. I just thought that Frank speaks with so much conviction and confidence. Mm. And when I watched the press conference, I watched it twice, mm. and I just was completely sold by everything he was saying. Mm. This isn't me being a fanboy right now and just you know just seeing all the positives without being realistic. Mm. It's my honest, realistic take. Yeah. The well, dude, it's, it's like ready the, for this. yeah, the the neutrals, the journo's, people that work in media, the sort of measured individuals that don't have an agenda. Everyone will praise Lampard of how he delivers, and 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 on that press conference, he had the perfect balance of the elated boy who's come home. He didn't, he wasn't too sterile. He gave the little cracks, the smiles, and he was like, you know, obviously I'm delighted, but he also yeah. went straight back to killer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's Frank yeah. Lampard from the pitch, man, and, and like. And what and what we um what's a really salient point is you talked about the kids working hard and that you know it's all very well getting trophy winning managers in from Italy or whatever but yeah. who the fuck yeah you know, all these kids they're looking at Frank Lampard they yeah. want to work hard for Frank Lampard it's like the, the Zidane story right. And this isn't a young kid, this is a different example. And I might have said yeah. it on the pod before, but when Rafa Benitez coached uh, Real Madrid, he tried to tell Cristiano Ronaldo how to take free kicks, and he basically just told them to do one. And then <laughs> Z- 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 Zidane comes in, right? And yeah. he doesn't tell him how. He says, you know what, uh, Cristiano, let's have a free kick competition. And uh, Zidane won, and he's like, right, I'll teach you how to do it my way. And he immediately won his, his respect. So that's like kind of a cool little humbling story, and you can imagine yeah. a lot, a lot of that happening with um with Frank, you know, and he and he's he like he said in that press conference, he's worked, he's worked. That's 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 the one positive. Well, there's obviously loads of positives of Chelsea, Chelsea's model of managers purely because we're the most successful English team this century. But the revolving doors of top tier managers, Frank was soaking it up, man. You know, he wasn't mm-hmm. just um under one pragmatic coach that managed to grind out results for. 15 years he he tasted all of it so that surely that's got to be in his head right i i really believe that to be the case as well um of course he's had a very rich history working under so many different systems and tactics as you said Mm. and i think that through all of that that's what's really shaped his own ideas on the game Mm. and how he believes the game should be played and you know I've been saying for a while, if you guys want to get a little bit of context in regards to how he might be for this season, Mm. you need to look at the academy uh, last season when Lampard was the manager alongside, you know, alongside Morris. Morris. And, um, you know, Lampard has the perfect conditions now to Mm. translate that stuff to Mm. the academy. And I know that a lot of people are going to be talking about Derby and trying to look at the tactics and his style from from his time at Derby. But um, you're not going to get the, the full take. And, mm. and I say this because when he went to Derby, him and Morris decided that they had to adapt to the strengths of the players. They had to 
you know, maybe <sighs> dumb down sounds a bit rude, mm. but uh, it's just very easy to just get across what I'm trying to say right yeah, now. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, they, they dumb down the tactics a bit at Derby for the players to understand it. He won't be doing that when he comes here. No. He's got much better players yeah. when it comes to that. So um, I mean, the positives just keep... <sighs> I'm yeah. just thinking positives every few seconds now. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and with, I think it can't be understated of how important Jody Morris is in all of this. And not because he knows the youth backwards and he coached them to match the record of the Busby Babes and won a quadruple trophy yeah. winning season. Because that's all great. And Edwards, and, and Edwards promotion as well. Because they're really good coaches. And Lampard is a good coach and he's going to get better. But Lampard seems to be, like Zidane... Um, an amazing man manager, and for me, that is the most ev- evident or big biggest piece of evidence of that is certain games in his campaign with Derby, the cup games. Mm-hmm. You know, I-, yeah. I was at the game when Frank came to, to church to Stamford Bridge of Derby. Like they shouldn't really have lost that game. He's of already not. They, they outplayed us. They outplayed... No, 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 outplayed is a bit strong, but they were the better team. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we were relying on own goals and you know a winner that probably shouldn't have stood. And, yeah. and you know, and, and honestly, man, the minute I saw that game, I knew straight away yeah. Lampard is ready because yeah, he can't come. He can't manage a Derby team. To play football in that style of manner, mm. to take the game uh, onto on us as well, mm. and and obviously, uh, you know, just becoming the better team as well. You mm. know, that proved immediately that Lampard is the right guy. I mean, you consider that, you know, for this season, we may be underdogs in some of the games against you know our closer rivals. Mm. When you know that, okay, Lampard's shown with Derby uh, last season that whenever his team are the underdogs. He always has them competing, hmm. and most times they've really profited from from games like that by winning. Yeah, well, Old Trafford, that's Ex- oh, Old Trafford. I mean, that it's game against United yeah. against us as well. I mean, hmm. um, the game against Leeds. Oh. I think the game against Leeds was really that was peak Frank Lampard for me because, hmm. hmm. of course, yeah, the story was that it's a coming um, of age is a moment, wasn't yeah. it, for a manager? Yeah, exactly. That's a great way of saying it. Yeah. And f- for me, it was like, you know, against uh, Leeds, there was so much history between Derby and them. I mean, yeah. you know, Bielsa. Oh, uh, it oozes obviously. Chelsea, doesn't it? It oozes <laughs> Chelsea narrative. Of course, of yeah. course. And it's just like they they lost the Leeds the first few times throughout the season, you know, very close as well. Yeah. That game in the playoffs where Leeds were the favourites, mm. Lampard came with a different game plan, a diamond with two up front. Mm. And the he Swiss changed it, but he just, changed yeah. it, didn't he? Yeah did and it mm. just works so perfectly and beautifully mm. and that was the main reason why they won and it and it's because obviously um you know Leeds like to play through the middle mm. so he's like we're gonna make it hard for you mm. we're gonna congest their area they have their their fullbacks for Leeds they like to make infield runs to help create overloads yeah twice their right back I forgot what his name's called twice he did that got dispossessed and Derby score from two counter attacks from winning the ball back from him mm. and this is a manager and obviously an assistant manager, Morris, too, mm. who understands what you need to do to win games. Modern football pragmatism. Exactly. Yet, yet wanting to go with the original initiative of being direct and attack. It's kind of, it sounds, you know, it does sound all too good to be true. And I, I can't help by getting super hyped. But what you've just kind of said there, Nini, is reiterated the point of sort of the, the team. Morris maybe getting in his ear, maybe Edwards, whoever the other, you know, is in the coaching staff on the bench. They consult each other. They believe in each other. Uh, by, by all accounts, Frank's a very, very good coach. But the man management skills for him to... I know he made that change that got the goal just before half time, But you, you'd back him in the changing room, you know, as much yeah. or nearly as much as a sort of JT, but maybe because of his tactical now as a manager, more than JT to say the right things to the team. And he keeps them in it. And this is why in, you know, in the second part, I want to get your sort of <laughs> really loose predictions about next <laughs> season. I'm not going to put yeah. any pressure on you about that, but I think Frank might do well in um, cups and stuff. Cause if you look at him, how he dealt against us and United in the cup and the playoffs, you can kind of view as a cup structure um, yeah. you know when he's got the Chelsea quality there's nothing I mean I'm not saying going to win the fucking Champions League but you know why not a domestic cup or something but we, we, we can we can talk about that in the second part yeah so let's talk a little bit while we're kind of on this band back together vibe um, I want to get your thoughts on Czech in just a second but other than what we know um, with Edwards, Morris, Czech, do you think there's anything else in the the Drogba, Makaleli rumours? 
Um, in the sense that, uh, yeah, I mean, Mac is going to replace Eddie Newton in, the, oh, in his so, previous role. So he's coming and in. When it, yeah, I mean, it comes to Drogba, it's still quite interesting because um, I remember saying on my channel like last year that the club had been speaking to him to uh, give him like an, um, an, an ambassador, ambassador role. Yeah. Now, talks are now that Drogba might want to come in a coaching capacity. Striker coach. Yeah. Lovely. I mean, pff, Drogba striker with Tammy. Oh. Yeah, and miss you. Like, you it's, know, not, I, it's not fair, but I mean, yeah. that's, this is what I mean. Yeah. Ah, real talk, bro. It's mm. so fucking exciting next mm. season. We've yeah. got the entire gang back. Mm. Talks that Ashley Cole might be coming back because why yeah, not? Yeah, I read that. Why today? not at this point? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's going to be a high fucking hype party. Of I course. mean, it, it's almost like a bit of a meme, isn't it? Like, just literally, like, everyone's just bowling up. But, um, yeah, I'd love Jogba as a, as a striker coach. So let's talk a little bit um, about, and also just just what what we've you know you're talking about Tammy like wanting to. Everyone wants to play under Frank Lampard. Yeah, I reckon the club people give the club and the board so much shit, but I reckon they're super smart. I reckon they know Sari probably wasn't going to work for a few reasons, even though he performed well and a lot of points could say he could continue and it would work but i think mm. right my theory is they've known how important ed and hazard's been for us the last seven years and they know how difficult it can be with us in the transfer ban losing him so they created a really good pr exit a really good mm. relationship with hazard that he's really happy the way it's left he's playing for the um, the foundation in greece on his holiday for chelsea yeah. you know no one's got any bad blood and they're like fuck how do we keep the the feel good factor. Good going, yeah. Bring Fat Frank in, get the golden generation back, get all the, you know, all the youth <laughs> yeah. are going to sign new contracts. Ruben's on a five year deal. It looks like Callum's going to re sign. Mount's buzzing. Abraham's yeah. buzzing. They're all signing. They're all going to commit their futures here. And it's like, you know, people have some doubts in regards to whether we should be, you know, relying upon the young players that, that we've been producing since they were like eight years old. And mm. it's like, Come on, you guys. Mm. We've got the old legends back now mm. that are going to be looking after these guys, that are going to be coaching them, improving them, mm. giving them the insight into the game that's going to help their development. Mm. And it's not There's out of no obli- need to be pessimistic now. No, absolutely. Yeah. And it's not it's not out of obligation. It's their prerogative. This is what they yeah. want to do. You know, exactly. this, is, this is what they want. This is what Morris adores those kids, and Frank's seen him play, and he's got a connection with them. They want to bring them through, and they yeah. want to, you know, Chelsea to still. I imagine when the window opens again, they'll be like, right, that sort of Morata and Hazard money. Can we um, pick someone a little bit nice <laughs> yeah, and get him in? You know, so, you know, they won't want to maybe jeopardize their developed youngsters, but if they see a gap, they're like, right, bang a worldie there. Sort of and thing. that's how it should. That, and I mean, yeah, and that's how it should be. I mean, I don't think football is very complicated. I really don't think it's that complicated. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I just look at clubs like Bayern, Barca's Real Madrid's as a reference point mm. and I ask myself okay why is it that these dynasty clubs are consistently part of the conversation mm. consistently the most powerful of the clubs but consistently you know competing every single year mm. how are they able to do this over decades and decades I mean you just look at their structure their model, their model yeah. mm. it's really not hard and it's just like in this country you know I think really fuck things up mm. all the foreign investors that came here and it's just like, I get it, you know, you're signing, you're getting involved in football for the money, for the business. Yeah. You weren't really a soccer fan or a football fan, wherever they're from. Mm. You don't care. You don't understand how it works. I mean, no wonder. I mean, I think Man United are a prime example of this. Mm. You know, a prime example of, yeah. of uh, not understanding the sport or respecting it. Mm. And there was a time in this club had like four central attacking midfield players. It's like, huh? Why would any team in the world need four cams in their team? Mm. It doesn't make any sense. And um, it's taken us 15 years to finally break this model. Yeah, but the model... It's finally just broken it under Frank, in my opinion. Mm. But it took... It needed... I say it needed to get worse. We just won another trophy and finished third. It's almost like what they had no inclination to change the model. Because everyone's like, oh, Chelsea never play the youth. You know, they they might stink it up sometimes or they do this or there's constantly trouble at the bridge. It's controversy. But like I said, we've just overtaken Man United for the most successful team in the 21st century. So people are like, well, they always fucking win. And, you know... Yeah, but but, but but for me, man, I've always been a perfectionist. And this Mm. is why, for example, like I love a Pep Guardiola... Mm. I love people that constantly strive to want to, you know, really become the very best they can be. Mm-hmm. And um, for me, it's, it's just the case of um, 
Sorry, man. I literally lost my train of thought then. I hate doing that. I hate doing that. <laughs> it's a club. The, basically, the European structure, like of buying and stuff, it's all very well us. Oh, yeah. Throwing in yeah. the cash and, and making, you know, making like success out of the trophy managers. But it did, you know, apparently it has a sell by date, right? And I think I always echo the sentiment in modern football now more than ever. And it's not just the Euro super clubs like Bayern, it's like the yeah. smaller Italian clubs, you know, that are successful in relation to their means, you know. Um, mm-hmm. It had to happen. It's interesting that you say like Man United because. They are fucked, you know. Well, they make loads of money. Yeah. They're the biggest footballing brand in the world. The yeah. Glazers, uh, you know, the United fans hate them, but but they bought the club on hey, the Hey, good reason. Good yeah, reason. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I just think, yeah, most of these foreign investors, if you don't have any respect for the sport mm. or the club's histories, for example, yeah. then please. But it's like with, this, with, with, the, with the FA, all they care about is deals, making money over mm. anything. And, and it's getting quite annoying in that sense, but I mean, um, you know, just bringing the, the conversation back to us again, mm. you know, I know what you were saying before. Obviously, um, we have been the most successful club since the the turn of the century, mm. but I'm a purist. Yeah. I know that there are lots of seasons where we should have done better, mm. should have won more. And mm. it's like, if you're a club like ours, the aspiration is to be the very best. I mean, mm. you don't want to be wasting all this time to be the third best, the fourth best. Yeah. Nah. You want to be the very best. Exactly. So I think to get to that model, what we're doing with Frank is the best way to get there because it's about planning for the future. You know, we, we don't have the clout where we can, you know, sign every big name player like X Finds. Not we anymore. We can't do that. Yeah. But even back then, even back then, we still struggled. Mm. I remember all the top players we tried to go for, mm. we either got priced out or they never wanted to come or they asked for crazy wages that we couldn't yeah. afford at the time. And this is what, what's cost us. And, and we can't, it's not sustainable to, to do that. And you look at this decade in particular, how many times have we been in the Europa League? Mm. How many times have we been knocked out of the group stage in the Champions League or not got past this stage? And that reflects the strength and dominance. You know and what's... I think that we have regressed a tiny bit. Yeah, I, well, I agree completely. And then we've sort of bub- plodded along with the odd lead title, league title with like yeah. European mercenaries that are good players and stuff. But you know what? I heard... I heard someone say I can't remember who said it on a podcast at one point now. Yeah. Chelsea's great like greatest players weren't bought the greatest players. Now you can make an argument for Eden Hazard, he was a wonder kid and yeah. a lot of people wanted him. But if you look at the John Terry's, the Frank Lampards, the DDA Drogba's, they came the tit- became the Titanic Chelsea elite, you know, giants of the game that were in this like Chelsea fortress that not everyone likes, but you know, they were just absolute giants of the game. They all evolved into these characters at Chelsea very rarely does Chelsea successfully buy big name players or somehow get an old, a big name player that used to be good and it's successful yeah so this model of bringing people through and letting them become you know great at Chelsea and, and knowing what it is to be Chelsea again and that kind of speaks with what you're saying about you know your sort of football purist uh, approach of you know, developing from within, having the culture, you know, kind of like, um, you know, the Chelsea Academy coming through a bit more. That, uh, Frank did that great line about the path yeah. between the buildings, didn't he? And um, it's a bit like, you know, how La Masia used to be at Barcelona, sort of like Chelsea are well known to have the best academy in England. So let's make it. I'd say Europe. It is, yeah. it, it, it is Europe. And, and yeah. when it comes to academy football, mm. it's Europe. Yeah, well, there you go. So exactly. So that I'm glad we saw. Sort of, covered that and the structure of that but i did want to ask you about petr Cech. so it, yeah, obviously a, a huge appointment in the terms of i spoke to joe about this and he was talking about balak and or someone like Czech. and i jumped at Czech and i said you know what i'd really fancy Czech because he's so intelligent he speaks so many languages people who have like come across him have you know, can talk to him about anything yeah. in the in the world, and he'd be such. And he's just fresh out the game, and he's been on the same pitch as young, thriving talent. So rather yeah. than some like you know yeah. six sixty year old Italian dude to come in, it just seems really smart. And the fa- I think it's also smart how they've given him this like ominous title of technical advisor, or whatever it is, because I feel like they'll assess how they can use this brilliant man. In, in what his best attributes are and I wouldn't be yeah. surprised to see his title changing 
discreetly on the website 12 months time yeah um, I th- that's a very good point I, yeah. I do think that it's been it's been a long time coming i think uh, a lot of us have known for a, a long time you know what the club's plans were to replace a manalo it was never going to be a case of giving full power to a director of football because mm. you know there's too much politics at the top wasn't mm. working out and uh you know this way you know because a, a link is needed now between mm. you know what happens on the pitch and what happens at the board level mm. and i think that when it comes to Peter, he knows all the players no one respected yeah. he knows all the board people as He's well roman's boy as well homies yeah roman. And, and, and obviously the biggest shout out has to go to joe tweedy because uh joe tweedy you know when the guy writes an article mm. <laughs> he really writes an article yeah the guy is one of the most like respected knowledgeable meticulous meticulous um i can he's respected and uh, yeah, the guy has contacts for days like yeah he showed me a bit of writing actually exactly yeah, exactly yeah. you know you know yeah, yeah. Know, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he from this this another amazing article he wrote discussing plans for petter check to be um the, the the new you know technical director director of football whatever mm, yeah and uh it's just like so on point as mm. always and yeah. yeah he just has that habit of always being on point. Yeah, he does. Yeah, I love speaking to Joe, man. He's um, like you say, yeah, he's very, he's very direct and meticulous. You can tell he's one of those people that um, has a, you know, very, a very good linear thought process. And you know, yeah. fa- failing Petr Cech with his connections to the club, who knows, Tweeds could have been technical director. Of I honestly think if once he, if he ever decides <laughs> to stop doing uh, investment banking, yeah. I think you can easily get a job in football very easily. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Yeah, he watches a lot of it and he's um, got his finger on the pulse. I remember <laughs> just what, I mean, this is the kind of podcast when you can talk about what you want. So yeah. I remember a pre-season, I went to go and watch a Chelsea youth game. Now I went yeah. as a VIP of this Surrey FA thing. I had like a suit on and I was buzzing and I was drinking champagne, getting pissed up and I thought I was the shit. But um, I was, it wasn't like, the A grade. Uh, I knew Hudson the Doy wouldn't be there, but it wasn't like because it was yeah. quite an intimate, small thing, right? So I was like, ah, oh. I was chatting to the Chelsea coaches, like, oh, it's Dujon Sterling here. I was like, no, nah, Dujon's gone home. Basically, it was like the B, the B Tech <laughs> Chelsea Academy. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> so I was like dropping these names, and this guy was looking at me like, nah, mate. But um, <laughs> there was a there was a kid there called Ballo. I don't know if you've heard of him. Yeah. And um. I, I didn't know I did and he was like a number 10 the new, he's, the, new, the, new, the new Austrian signing isn't he yeah yeah. mixed race guy yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly yeah and he the basically only he yeah. caught my eye right and I was like this kid's fucking shit hot and um, you know when I was chatting to Joe just on the DMs or something he immediately knew who he was and just gave me the lowdown and I was like oh cool <laughs> enough, yeah, that's what I mean <laughs> yeah and it, it, that's the sick thing about that age group you saw because um, you know guys like him Chelsea Youth Carefree Youth all these guys mm. have been speaking very highly about you know, the new academy graduates yeah. uh, for next season. And, um, you know, when you consider too, you know, we've got uh, Ballo, we've got the Swedish prodigy coming in as well in the next oh, yeah. few months, I think. Well, I, well, I forgot what his name's oh, called. Man, I did a I video on him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, the future's looking bright. Yes, and we sir. still have that we still have that same clout in regards to, uh, you know, bringing in the best ones. So mm. this is where Lampard's appointment makes even more sense Absolutely. because... If you're one of the best 16-year-old players in Europe, and we've had a habit of signing these guys at mm, this club, Christensen being a massive prime example, mm. if you've seen, okay, three years from now, we want to sign this amazing Spanish 16-year-old. I've, he's seen that guys like hudson Adoy, Mason Mount, and others are getting opportunities. Mm, exactly. Of course, he's going to tell himself, mm. I'm going to sign for Chelsea because it's best for my career. Yeah. I'm going to get the opportunity to play. Yeah. And it's an amazing structure. And yeah. I think... We've, uh, this was the final piece we needed, man. Mm. The and final as, piece we needed. And as much, obviously, in that, you know, Chelsea have had a lot of bad rep when it comes to youth, and this is the turning point that we needed. But I've referenced it, and I think, in one of my YouTube videos that, you know, you look at these kids, are going to look at that and do exactly what you said. But also, they're going to look at someone like Phil Foden, who's meant to be, like, one of the best young English tens or wherever yeah. he plays, or, you know, attacking mids in, in, in Europe. And... You know, he's doing well for the England under-21s, but Callum hudson Adoy is getting called up to the senior squad, making his debut and immediately making his competitive debut. Uh-huh. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And that's he, yeah. who's he held from the Chelsea Academy. So um, just to finish on part one, Nini, do you think um, Petter will have anything 
to do with transfers and stuff? Do you think he'll be like a consultant for... Do you think they'll work as a team? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, I think what's going to be great is the fact that they all kind of understand what needs to be done. Mm. It should be quite easy to you know, decide about, you know, what's going to be the most uh, definitive decision. Mm. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a case of, you know, assessing areas in the squad that need improving, targeting players with the right characteristics to play in the team. And mm. then obviously the sweet talking from, uh, you know, an ex legends mm. trying to get this player to sign. Mm. I mean, I, I know that uh, there's, there's nothing concrete, but I, I'm sure you saw those little reports about Neres saying that he's going to stay Ooh. one more season. <laughs> don't, don't get the listener thinking, too hyped. Oh, <laughs> I'm not going to get them hyped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, one he's more sick. season. Yeah. And, he, and come on, he, players are smart. When it comes to negotiating deals, there's lots of discussions. They have mm. to assess where they're going to play, how they're going to be used, mm. playing alongside potential new teammates, how that's going to work. Mm. There's a lot of detail Young that goes guys into too, this. Like Pulisic, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So yeah. just using that logic, you're going to mm. think, okay, I'm Neres. What teams can't I go to? I can't go to Man City because they're full up there. I can't mm. go to Barca. Exactly. I can't go to Juve. I can't go to United like, Bayern shit. potentially. But it looks like they could be signing someone else. United, you're not going to go fucking go to United now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, they're a few years away from getting yeah, to the level yeah. they need to be at. Yeah. You're Neres. You're thinking it makes sense for me to stay one more season here. Mm. Because there's a chance that the big blue club in London might be coming in. Oh, it's me. London as well, man. Do you know what ah, I mean? It's just like. Oh, it, it makes too much sense it does, to steal. It does. I tell you. I tell you what, Nini. We're gonna wrap up part one, man. Um, in part two, we'll look ahead. We'll speculate, and I'll put loads of pressure on you to make predictions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome back to Yannick on Chelsea, part two. I'm still here with my homie Nini from Blue Lions TV. We've been shooting the shit about Chelsea uh, in the first part, how exciting it is to have Lamps home, what to expect from the backroom staff. But now we're going to delve into the great unknown, Nini, mate. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask you, right, your what you think, how you think... I mean, Lampard's going to be flexible this season, but how you think generally he'll line up uh, and then we're going to go through like positions, talk about how you think those positions will be filled with what players at the yeah. beginning of the season and then maybe later in the season once Frank's got his feet under the table um, and, you know, injury dependent as well. And then we'll do like maybe just speculate on how he'll do in the season. So, okay, sweet. So I'll start by asking you formation wise, do you think... I mean, I don't think... I, I think it will be a 4-3-3, switch into a 4-2-3-1, but not really like a Regista-style 4-3-3. What, what do you think, mate? I don't know. I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this because obviously, you know, you guys, I do have like videos coming out, but, you know, it is quite hard to, <laughs> you know, constantly do videos every single day. But yeah. um, I think there is going to be an evolution Mm. I think it is going to be gradual. You know, Lampard is smart. He's going to assess the team. He's going to come to an understanding that, listen, I've got guys like Ruben, hudson Adoy, Reese out. They're three key players that could yeah. really improve the team. Yeah. yeah. So I think for now, he might rely upon a system the players are quite familiar with uh, so far. Mm. And that's how uh, Sari used them last year. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to be super possession heavy like we were last season. Mm. It will be adapted a tiny bit, but mm. I, I'm expecting Jorginho to start at the base. Mm. Well, I expect keep... that to happen from the start, and then when Ruben comes back, yeah. that's when we'll really start to see some uh, Shift. some differences. Then, well, keep your powder dry on who's gonna play where because I'll pick your brain on that in just a few minutes. But you you imagine a four three three because I think Frank does like to play with the ball if he can. Um, yeah. I think he's happy to play about the ball and he doesn't mind a pacey, useful counter-attack. But um, I've been sort of hearing all sorts of stuff when I hear people speculate or people that watch Derby or how he... Apparently he's even switched to a free free back formation for a little bit. Yeah, but I, I'm yeah not sure. I mean, but, but this is the thing with Frank. Now, some people think that we're going to swap formations like crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to happen. No, it's, it's only going to happen yeah. depending yeah. on the opposition. Now, for example, with Derby last year, uh, Lampard would use maybe a 4-2-3-1 mm. 
mm. against the very big teams like us, Man United, mm. et cetera, et cetera, because he used that formation for a high-pressing counter-attacking game. Mm. That's why uh, Mason Mount was a guy who was playing Cam. And so some important. people think, yeah, yeah, of course, you know, pressing in modern-day football is important. Mm. I and mean, when you look at someone like a Mason Mount, for example, to be that young, to have that work ethic application and the quality, I mean, for me, He's like another version of like a Kevin De Bruyne, you know, that's saying that stylistically, you know mm. what I mean? Mm. But, um, but yeah, we are mainly going to be a 4-3-3 team and depending on who we play in the, in Europe or, or depending on injuries or depending on the type of opposition, mm. then there might be some flexibility in regards to, you know, different formations we use. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. I feel like, uh, there's the sort of I did a video of when I you know I did a bit of research I did a YouTube video I was looking at his four three three dropping into sort of you know the the conventional four yeah. five one out of possession and like you say deploying a four two three one when necessary but some people speculate that he might try diamond um you know fuck no it, whether it will be like a two striker diamond or it'll be like a, a striker hey, and a support it's a beautiful thing man it could be what if it's purely up front with with tammy or what if it's tammy and yeah and this up front i mean the, the possibilities are real you know yeah but then also like you could have like yeah like pulisic um supporting bashwai tammy or even Giroud because Giroud can be the bouncing board for the support striker and then you know then you've got a midfield diamond of that's suddenly open. If you've got a midfield diamond with four players in midfield, suddenly you can have Mount in a 10 with Ruben playing left centre mid all of a sudden. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's, a, that's a team that accommodates two players in arguably their best positions. And then, you know, you could have a Jorginho at the base and Kante on the right. Do you know what I mean? Which is just a madness. But, um, I mean, you know, I want to, we can talk about players and positions in just a sec. So we know he's going to be. A pragmatist, he's gonna like try different, um, try different like formations out, but um, you know what? I, I, because I want to spend some time on this as well, we can start getting into it now. And I do want to talk a little bit about our expectations afterwards and not just the expectations, the patience of both fans and board and etc. So, yeah, I don't think there's um. Have we got three goalkeepers at the club at the moment? Or was it just Kepper and Willie? Oh, we got Kepper, Cavalero, and what Cummings or something? Oh, the young lad, right? Okay, yeah. The yeah. Young so kids. that's a good, that's a good trio. Um, so I don't think there'll be any doubt of all profile, you know, games of any form of profile. Ke- Kepper will be in goal. Yeah. Um, let's start with fullbacks, Nini. Um, so it's a conventional left back position now the interesting thing about frank lampard is he's giving everyone a look in like if you've seen these preseason, you know uh pictures or videos footage it is like throwbacks coming in you got like you know you've got fucking <laughs> yeah. lewis baker you've got casey palmer you've got um is it callas hey, this, yeah this uh, hey let's not give up on uh on lewis baker i i, I i've yeah. heard that People yeah. behind the scenes still rate the player. Yeah, two so thirds. Hopefully, right? yeah, I miss what I mean. Mm. He's just been so fucking unlucky that he's. It's the club's fault. Shit, it's shit the loans. club's fault. Yeah, it is. Because you know what happened in the first place, yeah? Mm. Obviously, amazing season, season at Vitesse. Mm. He comes back. And this is where we were on our bullshit, you know, like two seasons ago. Mm. We're like, you know what? No one's leaving on loan until mm. we've signed a replacement first. And of course, when you do that, mm. you limit the amount of options for the player. Stuck in limbo. That's like Swansea and Newcastle were looking at him, a lot of other ones as well. But as time kept going on, no clubs are able to make any uh, uh, resolve, resolve any you know, mm. final conclusions at the end. All he really has is the uh, is Tony, the championship Tony now, Pulis it, Borough yeah I guess what I'm saying Tony Pulis fucking Middlesbrough <laughs> and it's like this guy is a top player I mean yeah. left foot right foot set piece king yeah. he can pass and I really feel that maybe his future could be deeper because mm. I think that to play further up you need to have more work rate I don't really think that's really his game but mm. the guy moves the ball so damn quick with either foot mm. I really hope that he gets the right move Mm. And uh, I hope that uh, he's able to, you know, get some respect back. I mean, he was getting it at Reading mm. when they, f- the first team in two seasons to finally use this guy in a in, in, in a role that suits him the best. And and this is really what modern day football is about, you know. It's, mm. it's so the reason why it comes down to luck, it comes down to all these small little micro decisions every single time, and it, a lot of luck. 
imagine if Tony Pulis wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. And then a more attacking friendly manager comes. Mm. Things would have been completely different. But again, yeah. comes down to the club with the stupid, you know, these outdated, just headstrong, inflexible decisions they make. And it ends up, you know, costing players. Well, you're right. And but like, hopefully for the lad, he should be buzzing now with the whole feel good factor in the sense yeah. of I think you know, I don't know, I've read it, I don't know if he actually said it, but you know, rightly so, Lampard will be looking at drink water. Do you know what I mean? He's gonna be looking at fucking everyone. Yeah, I mean, of course he's gonna look at them. He's a new yeah. manager, you wanna keep things on a good mm. vibe, but I mean realistically <laughs> I can't uh, even uh, this is the thing. I, I, drink water is not a shit player no like, he's not some like i mean he's not yeah. he's a premier league winner and like I, I look at that goal he scored for us when he like you know his only goal for chelsea yeah. it's an absolute monster the outside of the and uh, again it comes down to shit club decisions and this mm. is what happens when you don't have a technical advisor in that yeah. sense because if you had someone at the top they'd be saying okay you want to get drink water but if this if conte is not going to be here next season mm. and we use a different manager with a different side of football drain. are we really going to be able to use drink water in his best position i mean come on mm. like and, uh, yeah to be honest as well like to caveat that i did actually have a little deep dive and uh drink water stats when he was you know playing for uh, Leicester. Was, they're yeah not, they're not that great to be honest <laughs> i thought like i had this like romance in my head of can't amazing kante wins the ball gives it to drink water he gets rid of it and they've got this amazing duality and everything's cool but you know to be honest was, his numbers weren't even that great so so yeah i, I know what you mean but i i i think you know, when it comes to just like looking at midfield players in particular, I really think I, a lot of modern day fans are really struggling when they like, you know, they'll look at stats and they'll look at a midfield player. And it's like, you have to have a, you have to understand the context of the game. Mm. You know, in midfield, it's the most important position. Well, really. Kovacic has been done dirty. By exactly. But I mean, the stats really do him justice. Mm. And yeah. it's like, for me, I always saw those performances with my own eyes. Mm. But because he wasn't, he didn't have a goal threat in him, mm. he's just automatically dismissed by oh. like 90% of Premier League he, fans. And, and the fucking media and, the, you know, these so-called... Um, yeah, these so-called ones, well, yeah. Broadcasters. But, you know, for me, Kovacic, I did a video on him as well. And for, he, for me, he's like a Galactico-level silkiness on the ball. But, but let's, 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 like, let's... He's the guy you want on your squad, but yeah. Sorry, yeah, man. yeah, yeah. So I, just, just to rein it back. But um, So I, was, I wasn't off on the tangent there. So he's going to have a look at everyone. And what I want to do is start a left back. So the, the, the theme at the moment is the conventional situation with the left back is Emerson trumps Alonso. Do you see... Anything different happening there? Do you see him giving... Because as long as I had a couple of good games, I don't want to do him too dirty. <laughs> but for, for me, I've said this I've said this before, man. Like, that, that, that heartbreak when you watch Ed and Hazard look at Alonso, like, what the fuck are you doing, man? There's those images when he, like, shrugs his shoulders, like, come on, and you just of think... Of course. That, you know and I mean? it's just like, I always saw there was this reluctance in, like, Hazard to want to, like make certain passes to Alonso. Yeah. Like for, there's, there's a reason why Hazard with Emerson was so much quicker and faster. Like, yeah. You know, He's you jumping know, like, on him, celebrating on him. Yeah. Yeah. As, soon as, as soon as Hazard had the combination of Emerson and yeah. Loftus-Cheek down that left flank, he probably thought, oh, it's a shame I really want to go and, to and Real Madrid. And that's when sorry ball really started to work. Yeah. Once we had those three players there, that's yeah. when it started to work. Well, on that, <laughs> and for me as well, Marcus Alonso, right? Like He has scored some big... For me, he's literally like a centre forward that somehow is playing left back, you know, like the way he like, he can head the ball, he can sniff out a goal in the box, Pochi, he's got a sweet left foot volley, he's a dead ball specialist, um, and he's just, you know, he's like a decent striker, but not one that you generally want as a striker for other reasons, that's for some reason fucking playing left back. Um, anyway, Emerson over Alonso for you, is a, does Alonso get a sniff under Lampard? Um, listen, Alonso's had, what, two and a bit seasons now to really get a lot more respect put in his name, mm. and he hasn't done it. Now, of course, it could come down to the the system, you know, when you use a high line, yeah. a lot more is, uh, obviously, a lot more physicality is needed, pace, etc., etc. Hey, Alonso doesn't have that. That's not his game. Mm. Um Nah, I mean, nah, I'm, I'm sorry. Alonso just doesn't compliment anything. He doesn't. Yeah. Well, we could flip him and make a profit now. No I'd doubt. like to think so, but when you're hearing that with Price now, let's go Madrid, and it's like, come on, you guys. Mm. Who the hell is going to buy Marcus? How, much, well, how much did we sell him for? 50 million. 
I think we signed him for like uh, 20, yeah. 20 million or something. Okay, right. Million. Okay, so still, if you're if you're a European club and you're looking for a left wing back who's a goal threat, you know he's he's got to be up there on the list, isn't he? Like, yeah, but the goal threat thing. I mean, yeah, it comes into handy every now and then. It's mm. sick, but I mean, you know, ideally, you know, I think fullbacks are more important in in uh, helping, uh, you know, keep possession of the yeah, play. Yeah, but I'm saying, like, fields. say you're an upper mid tier Italian side, and you're like, right, we're really attack heavy down the right. Um, we've got a really good left middle centre back in the back three and the left centre you know is a really good you know I'm right I'm writing like a niche yeah. requirement here but yeah. there, there is a situation out there where he's your man do you know what I mean but yeah. um yeah. Anyway, anyway, I don't want to spend you know too, Yeah, go, I know go. you don't want to spend too much time, but yeah. Alonso was always he's always been s- such a weird player for me because it's mm. like he's really one of those players, but you can't use stats to do him justice. Yeah. You need to watch him with your own eyes because you'd assume that with the goals he scores, he's an attacking fullback. When you actually watch him play, mm. he doesn't do anything great oh, offensively, man. other than than I, me. Maybe I'm being a bit too cynical. You know, me, man. I take it as him just purely doing a Gerard's being selfish, moving in the box himself to get some glory. Yeah. And every Hazard, now Hazard and then, said that as well, yeah. didn't he? Hazard did he, said did he? that. He, I, Hazard, I well, not, not, in, not in those words. He says, I always see him running in front of me when he sometimes he needs to be behind. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Obviously, and Hazard oh, comes out saying it, like, basically, he's just of not course, doing the right thing. We all, we all fucking knew it, didn't yeah, we? Yeah. Come on. All right, so Emerson, hands down, more of a dynamic, gets up and down quicker, better engine, essentially in the mould of a modern fullback. Uh, and on that mould of modern fullback, let's switch over to the other flank. Aspi, great one-on-one defender, gives 100% for the club. Apparently, like, the most professional player you could ask for. Bit of a Chelsea legend, a bit to it for in a lot of ways, but not really in the mould of a modern dynamic fullback, uh, certainly right back. Obviously, I think you're in the camp of many of us that a modern dynamic fullback built for the top flight in English football is in the mould of Reese James um, for you know a multitude of reasons in terms of his skill set and uh, physicality, speed. But he's injured. I can't imagine for him to start. So how do you feel about the right back position? Um, I think right back has to be Aspie for now, but mm. I kind of see Aspie just maybe looking after the position until uh, until Reese is fully fit. Yeah. Do you so you you do? Would you say by the end of the season it's Reese's if he's fit and been training with the squad? Yeah, I think it's a matter of time mm. to be honest. Yeah. And as yeah, and uh, maybe deploy Aspie in the games where Frank knows he's going to be sitting in a bit more because Aspie was so good in that yeah, home game. But I think City. I think Reese is that good defensively that you don't really need to bring on an Aspie yeah. to be more solid, if you know what I mean. Yeah, fair dues. All right, well let me. Okay, so here's a here's a we've they're both pretty easy. So here's a tough one yeah. for you. Oh. C- Centre back pairing, mate. <laughs> what, <laughs> what do you think? Obviously, Rudy's injured. He's quite a fan yeah. favourite. So I don't I mean, know why, but, you know? Uh, but I, I do know why. I do know why. Okay, but, yeah. so okay, so what's your f- first half of the season centre back pairing and second half of the season centre back pairing? If indeed it changes, uh, I mean, thank you for just making it much more easier. Yeah. Um, for the first half, it needs you need to have David Luiz in there. I'm mm. sorry. Um, you know, he's his uh, communication skills, leadership, mm. uh, and the guy. I, I, I don't understand why people hate him. I think it's so unfair. I think it's uh, no, you know, yeah. you're, you're letting, yeah, you're, you're, he's you're been more reserved as well. He's, he's chilled out a little the bit. The thing, he, he's nowhere near as flamboyant as he used to be, and, and I kind of miss that because that's why I used to love David Luiz because yeah. he's like, you know what, I'm going to be so unashamedly myself, mm. use me or, or, or lose me. Obviously, Mourinho coming here. You can't have a personality mm. when you're playing with Mourinho. So, uh, yeah. but I mean, yeah, he's 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 improved defensively drastically compared to when we first had him for mm. our first spell. But yeah, Luis needs to be there, and alongside him is King Kazuma. Yeah. King Kazuma, and for the second half of the season, yeah, it needs to be King Kurt and uh, and Classy Chris. Oh, I like it. I tell you what. Yeah, I have been talking about Kurt Zuma, right? Starting for the world champions and scoring goals for them, apparently. You know, yeah. Emmerich Laporte doesn't start for them. 
Kurt Zuma fucking does. If you and bought... you know why, man? I, I, I'm sorry, look, can you on. continue. You continue. I'm well, no, that, I mean, that's pretty much what I was going to say. Like, <laughs> all I was going to do is end that with, for me, in terms of how well he's done for Everton and how he's starting for the World Champions and found his form and confidence, he's like a £50 million signing returning to the club, in my opinion. He, yeah, he is. And, uh, you know, Didier Deschamps never, ever gave up on Kurt Zuma. And it, Kurt has been, he's been very unlucky. If he never sustained that uh, that knee injury, yeah. he was going to go to the Euros and he would have started alongside Varane. I mean, mm. there's been so many articles and interviews of Didier Deschamps speaking about future plans and Didier Deschamps rates Zuma very highly. Mm. And um, when you, this other coaches as well, uh, Mourinho, was in, in, in very high praise of Kurt Zuma. Yeah. He said that, um, you know, he, he's like a Varane style defender, which he is. Mm. I mean, I think Zuma and Varane are the same. Mm. They're statistically similar, the way they play, yeah. their pace, how they tackle, how they move the ball. The exact same style. And um, everyone knew that Zuma, it was going to be a matter of time. And, and this is why he's a king for me. Mm. Because this club just didn't support him enough. They never so. did. The doubts have replaced them after his injury. And it's like, come on. Yeah. You've I mean, just signed Rudiger the following season at the same exact injury. Mm. Why are you not using that against him? Yeah. Why is it that guy, Zuma, it's an issue now? But you know what? He, he just didn't moan at all. He just had this quiet self-belief that he was always yeah, going to get a passing ha- spot. Dude's fucking called Happy Zuma. He's, you know, he's, but he's, but he's, he's such a joy as a teammate. But he's a can be a yes. mean, he can be a mean motherfucker on the pitch, and that's what you want. Yes, dude. And I think that he could be a future captain as well. Yeah, well, this you know, goal threat as well. Where he can be that. He can. He can. Isn't he like? Yeah. He's way super quick, and um, and on Christensen, ball play, seems to have regained his confidence after his um sort of dip in uh, with uh Conte uh, I, I, I blame sorry for the the confidence thing with Christensen. Do you mean Con- uh, Conte? I mean sorry uh, Conte? Well, sorry. well 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 Christensen uh, well okay so this is this would be interesting. So I yeah. think right when Christensen made a few high profile mistakes under Conte, right? Remember yeah. the Barcelona mistake, yeah, when he yeah. crossed the when he passed across the goal and then he made a couple I think he should have been taken out of the limelight for like a couple of games, right? But instead, Conte overcooked him until he literally had to drop him, in my opinion. Um, and that, that's what created a problem. But with Sari, I feel like Sari found a centre-back pairing that he wanted. And then, obviously, he had to play Christensen again with the injury to Rudiger. But Christensen found good form and he he basically was a top tier player again and just yeah. on it as well i've said this on the pod before that game when we lost one nil to manchester city i've said this to a couple of guests before when um we lost one nil and it was that shameful conte <laughs> attempt oh, it? yeah yeah yes. we were bent over but christensen was really good in that game and the first thing guardiola did when the whistle blew he went he beelined to him and like latched onto him and got in his ear so you mm. know like he he sort of looked at him and went, oh, I fancy a bit of that. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So yeah, of course. So you, you you fancy Christensen to be to be the one? Yeah, I mean, I I think you know this season in particular, it's kind of like dreams coming true. And I've always envisioned seeing Christensen and Zuma partnering together. I mm. mean, every time I get FM, it's mm. always Christensen and Zuma. It's always been like that for me every mm. single edition. So mm. uh, I just want to see it in real life now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I fancy it. <laughs> They've definitely got good, both young, both, um, well, Zuma can have the physicality and technical ability still. Goal yeah. threat, goal threat on set pieces. Christensen can pick up the ball, morale into midfield. He's even played in midfield before. Um, yeah. A very versatile defender and cerebral defender. So, so I'm with you of that, which can uh, lead us on to a very very difficult question of a midfield free and um you know i know you mentioned you could see Jorginho starting there okay so again same question first six months after the first six months what's your midfield free my midfield three first six months would be Jorginho, kante and mason mount mm. last six months would be kante ruben and mason mount Oh, that is a naughty midfield in a second. <laughs> okay, so, right. Okay, so this is my I did a video on Kante today. Kante, for me, uh, he is a destroyer. So the second six months that you've just talked about, for me, has to be a fluid midfield free, where, can, you know, where all of them are allowed to move to a degree, right? Because for, for me, Kante couldn't have played in Sarri's uh, deep, deep sort of angry yeah. role because it, a, it would waste him he can't roam and destroy 
and B, he didn't have the metronomic cerebral speed. He's not saying he's a bad passer, but Jorginho is a specialist in the ball touches his boot, it's already gone. Uh, press resistant, you know, release the ball. That's not Kante's particular, you know, main attribute and also wastes everything else. So if he's yeah. going to sit in that lone mid free of a pivot, you know, his best works always come in the two, right? Khan, Leicester, Chelsea. So if he's going to be that deep one in the free, for me, it has to be like a roaming free where he's got license because otherwise, yeah. you know, w- would you agree with that? Um, I think, yeah. Because if, if, if he's camped out in front of the back four and he's like, oh yeah, you sit in this pivot and the ball's going to go through you, I feel like it's just not Kante at all. That and that, yeah, I mean, that's the reality. I mean, with Kante, you know, I mean, Kante, what I love about him is a guy that he's very happy to learn, he's flexible, and he's willing to, you know, ad- ad- adapt, basically. Mm. Um, of course, with Kante, his best trait is a ball winning midfielder, in my opinion, you know, winning back possession quickly and covering, covering ground. Again. That's his best position, covering ground, closing the spaces. And I think there's, there's not a better, like, if you're going to play a counter pressing style, Mm. You want can say further up winning the ball. Yeah. It just makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I agree. So Jorginho, how how's he gonna fit? Do you reckon we flog him next summer? He's gonna be wanting to start. Potentially, potentially. I think Jorginho is gonna be very interesting to see. I mm. think that if you're not using a register mm. a system, he can still excel because Jorginho it's when you're a player, player that moves the ball quickly, mm. you're always going to be able to do something in the modern game. Plays he higher up for Italy. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. does. And I mean, look at how Italy play. You know, mm. their midfield is now set, mm. and they they there's a lot more fluidity mm. with how they play now. And um, I'm, I'm all for it. Mm. We're a club that wants to have ambition to be the best. You need to have a top class midfield that are going to be competing with each other to get in the first team. And um. Uh, Jorginho is good for the squads. Mate, he's top for me for what he is and for his skill set. He's top one of the best. Yeah, what in his skill set? Yeah, and I think that um, I, I it's it's so hard because I want to see Mason and Ruben together in midfield. I mm. think Lampard will do that too. That's what mm. he's working towards. And I just want to go on like a tiny tangent. Go but, ahead. Um, you know, anytime I I think about tactics and Lampard's, you know, listen, Lampard was a box box midfield player, mm. one of the greatest goal scoring ones in the history of the game. He knows what it takes to get the best out of midfields. Mm. He, he knows what you need to do, and I feel like a release has just helped number eights. You know, mm. in my latest video I released today, I spoke about uh, you know Lampard and Mikel back in the day. Mm. You know, that season when Lampard got twenty seven goals. Ancelotti using Mikel in a similar way to how Jorginho is being used. And it benefits number eight so much because, one, number eights normally are in free space all the time to receive the ball and start attacks. And when you've got guys like Mikel and Jorginho to move the ball that quickly and see the entire game, Mm. that's exactly what a number eight wants because that means he can start doing what he does more. Obviously, um, they allow them to then, you know, break the lines, attack the spaces, move forwards. And there's a reason why, you know, when Ruben was introducing the team, Jorginho looked better. And I think that he looked better to most fans mm. because now his passing was more effective because he had an effective player to pass to. Yeah. Well, that's a really salient point because I was, you know, I never was like a super... I mean, I was I was a fan of Sari, but I didn't defend him blindly. I always try and be measured. From being a podcast host for a year, you learn to try and be measured. I'm sure you know that with just being a, like a YouTuber, you know, channel owner. So, I, But I always absolutely came from the school of thought that Jorginho needs the the passes and the spaces to be made available to him by yeah. his number eight. So... Yeah, I mean, very good player. Kovacic, very good player as well. So they would both hope to get rotated in and out. But I like your forward vision of the young number eights flanking a roaming N'Golo Kante. And, uh, you know, it sounds naughty. So so let's talk about the front three. First six months, second six months and onwards. I think first six months. It's going to be the old boys, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm thinking, okay, I'm thinking a part of me feels that maybe Pulisic might start on the left-hand side. Oh, really? That would be quite interesting because I'm thinking with William now, is he as effective out wide? A lot of that's going to depend on how he performs during pre-season. Don't you fancy he'll, he'll want to go back to his native left, William? 
Yeah, no, you know, of course, you'd mm. expect that. But mm. uh, Willian hasn't been the same Willian. I mean, last season, you know, I was quite disappointed in Willian. I don't know what happened. I, you know, a lot of his game just wasn't really coming off as well as it normally does. And I don't know if that's, you know, time or whatever. Over the bell curve, maybe. Yeah, but I think maybe there could be, in a sense, you know, it's a bit predictable. You know, I think now teams understand what he's going to do. Mm. So, uh, and he's not as quick and sharp as he used to be. So, who knows? But I, I know that's just me just trying to be like different. I, I still think maybe Pulisic on the right, William on the left hand side, and mm. up front. Now, I've been thinking about this a lot. A part of me feels like Tammy, mm. but at the same time, Lampard might feel, listen, I don't want to put you in the spotlight immediately. Mm. Of course, Lampard knows how to work with young players, you know, things of the long term, you know, it's mm. what's best. Tammy, you're going to be playing. You won't be starting. Mm. Come, come in the second half of the season. Get more time. You could be a starter. Mm. So I think maybe it's either going to be Olivia Giroud or Mitchie Batshuayi. But um, I think Giroud because uh, yeah, he's a bit of a target man. I know mm. that at, at Derby, Lampard liked to use a similar style of target man. Mm. What was his name called uh, for Derby? It's not Waghorn, is it? Was it Waghorn? Yeah, maybe. he seems like quite yeah. big, dumb kind oh, of. Oh, Nugent. So, is it Nugent? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but him and Mike Horn yeah, yeah, were, yeah. were similar. And then the other guy, the smaller one, was Marriott. like a nippy. Marriott, yeah. Mm-hmm. He was like the fast in behind type of striker. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I think Giroud will start and then yeah. Yeah, a bit of a cult. Yeah. So yeah, so I was like always like I feel like it's gonna be Willian on the left, Pedro on the right, and Giroud while he gets the youngsters ready, and then yeah. you know, by the second half of the season, you know, Hudson the door on the left, Pulisic on the right, and then Tammy up front. How's that feel? <laughs> It feels like I want the second. I'm getting so excited. You're knocking your mic off off my desk now. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like I want. All I'm looking forward to is the second half of the season because when I see Reese, Ruben, Mason, Hudson, Tammy, oh, naughty, and and they're all built for the Premier League. Well, yeah, I'm going to see Tammy bang some goals, but the rest of them, they all look like they can do it in the Premier League. So yeah, right. So let's go to the last segment, Nini. Let's talk about. Uh, realistic expectations um, champions <laughs> fucking like yeah Paul Frank he's got a bowl up at Old Trafford I know he's done it before and he's got the Super Cup and before he even gets into the season but I want to get your thoughts on the domestic cups league finish domestically and what, how far in the Champions League mm, now I I'm um, listen for me top four I, 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 it's not even listen it's not a case of we got a younger team. They're not good enough now. Nah. Top four is what I I feel that we, we need to get. Mm. And then I think that's really like a trophy in that sense. You know, I think um, yeah. it'd be great. Uh, maybe the Carabao Cup. I think that would be a great tournament to win for younger players. Because mm. it's like the first time winning something. Senior at, trophy. At, yeah. At a, yeah, at a senior level, the first time winning something. That could have a massive psychological aspect in regards mm. to confidence and and going in, forward in the future. They would be my two goals. The Carabao mm. Cup win and top four finish. And then, mm. listen, in Europe, do yourself proud. I don't, as long as you're not outplayed or embarrassed, do yourselves proud. Yeah. And I think in other competitions, a... Hey, it is what it is. Well, this is this is the thing, right? Because if there's one thing Lampard can do is jeer his team up for the cup competitions. Like again, like I said before, like you know the cup run last season, and then the the, the playoffs. Like that sort of maybe what sorry lacked. He'll he'll galvanize like this is it, boys. I'm Frank Lampard. You know I'm final yeah. man. You know maybe Drogba's fucking knocking about the changing rooms. <laughs> so if you don't win, it's a fucking disgrace. Yeah, um, of course. <laughs> but yeah, um, you know what I mean? So that kind of vibe from Lamps, that, that might bode well. So I think I'll be happy with top six. Um, who, you know, who knows? We might get stitched up yeah. in the group stage at the Champions League and then win the Europa League and then qualify for the Champions League next season. But um, hopefully we don't drop out that early. So, yeah, man. all right. So I'm, I want to plug uh, Blue Lines TV and stuff. But finally, Nini, is Frank going to be given the time... <laughs> by, I mean, he's going to be given the time yeah. by the fans, but how long? And what about the board, Roman? Do you think he's yeah. got assurances? Do you think that's just paper talk? I think that I think there's two things. I think one, I think Marina kind of, I think it came out already. As long as we're not relegated, 
it, we're fine. Mm. But I think too, the club can't afford to, you know, not be patient with Frank Lampard. Mm. Imagine you try and sack Frank Lampard now that all these old players are back behind the scenes now. Mm. Potentially could be a mutiny. Who knows? Yeah, but it's, but it's not going to be good PR wise. That's an interesting. And I can point. imagine that all these old heads are going to talk their mouths off mm. behind the scenes mm. if any fuckery tries to happen like that. So, yeah. uh, and it, so I feel as if Lampard's yeah. safe. Yeah, yeah, and also like Frank doesn't seem like he's going to rebel rebel against the board, does he? He seems like he's, he knows the people there. The club's got a good relationship. Yeah. He's going to discuss what's happening. He's going to open his heart, be compassionate, and he's got all his homies around him to consult so they'll yeah. assess it together. He won't feel like isolated like Chelsea managers often of do. Of course, because now, because it's taken this club 15, 16 years, but now we've hired a manager and given him a proper support around mm. him, a real support. And that's where and, people bind what he's saying to. Exactly. He's the right character. And that's yeah. what made me drop, leave my prejudices of the door saying it's too early because, you know, I also know he needs the support and the best chance. And even though Chelsea is not in the best position at the moment, the support and the best chance comes from all that stuff you've yeah. just spoken about, mate. Yeah. So, Nini, uh, I want to say, say to the listener, Nini's the reason really why I started a uh, YouTube channel because too for me. Kind. <laughs> <laughs> for me youtube football youtube channels weren't really what something i was interested in but nini as i'm sure you can tell listener has a very good outlook on chelsea and analytical brain and a good knowledge and makes salient points so i'll urge all my listeners to go check out blue lions tv and subscribe to his channel because if you enjoy my content i'm pretty adamant you'd enjoy his content too you've just done a video today nini haven't you what was that on again yeah, so the video I've released today is the uh, top five players to watch out for for this preseason. Um, preseason is going to be exciting. Mm. Seven games. Yeah. So many players, so many different lineups and possibilities, and some big teams and some, you know, some unique teams as well. So, mm. uh, hey, it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be buzzing. Mate, thank you so much for coming on. I hope you'll come on a couple more times throughout the season if that's Bro, cool with you. Anytime you need me. There it is. That's Just a let me know. verbal contract. You've heard it here, listener. Thanks again, Nini. Thank you so much, mate.